Hello, all. Just waiting a moment till we actually hit 10 a.m. East Coast and whatever time that is in your region. Uh, I am taking a look at the list of people who have joined the meeting. I recognize some names. Happy, happy to have you on, uh, including, yes, a few people who actually reached out to talk about uh, to talk about analyzing this panel with me, perhaps over over LinkedIn even. Awesome. This is a this is a good way to start. All right, and it is 10 a.m., so let's get going. Welcome all. This is Analyzing the Hutches 50 Color Spectral Panel, Tips, Tricks, and Tools for Your High Parameter Data Using Logitech Software. Uh, this is a talk that, sorry, let me move out of the way of my name. Here we go. Uh, I'm John Quinn, uh, Director of Science and Product Development for BD Bioinformatics. That is my email address. I mean, sorry, I've got the, got, the, got the pointing thing backwards. There we go. Uh, john.flojo.bd.com. Uh, this is a talk I gave at AAI a couple of weeks ago. Uh, a lot of the focus at AAI was on spectral data across the industry. Uh, it seems that we have largely adopted spectral technology as you know, the way to collect high parameter data. And so there's quite a bit of discussion on how do I actually analyze that data? So let's, let's talk through it. Uh, we received enough requests for the slides for further discussion on this talk. We felt it was worth recapitulating it in webinar form. And here you go. So let us share some slides. And not Zoom. OK, I will largely uh, just go through the presentation uh, to keep on time and then do questions at the end. Uh, feel free to type them in the chat as they occur to you, as I hit a slide and you want to talk about it, even if you want to note the, the slide title, whatever, we can go back to it and talk. But just to make sure we squeeze this into an hour, let's do it. OK. So 50 color spectral panels are here. Uh, a lot of this talk is about OMOP 102, the 50 color phenotyping of the human immune system with in-depth assessment of T cells and dendritic cells. Uh, we should absolutely point out that this amazing data set was produced by Andrew Konecki in the lab of Martin Prillick at Fred Hutch Cancer Center. And it was supported by the grants listed there, the Flow Cytometry Shared Resource Grant uh, from the Fred Hutch University of Washington Seattle Children's Cancer Consortium and the Emerson Collective and NIH grants. Uh, numbers listed down there below given to Martin Prillick. It is great work. Absolutely want to highlight those folks and the funding that they received uh, to produce this groundbreaking panel. OK. And that leads us to our question. So cool, we've got our 50 color spectral panel. So what do we do with all the data? And the way I'd like to approach this talk is to put it into the form of the workflow that I use to analyze the data. And we'll talk through step by step. And a point of emphasis right off the beginning is that once we have unmixed data that we've collected on a spectral cytometer, it just becomes data. It is high parameter data. And so any tools that you have used in Flojo or any other software, I will hope a lot of Flojo users on a Flojo talk, fingers crossed, um, that can be applied to high dimensional or high parameter data can be applied to high parameter spectral data as well. The differences are all upstream in the collection, pre-processing, et cetera. And so let's, you can see from the, from the outline of this talk that the focus is going to be on a lot of upstream, uh, upstream discussion. And we'll just do a little bit of what I refer to as discovery at the end, talking about applying some high dimensional tools to this data. So let us start with panel design. Okay, the tool that I would like to tell you about that we use is the panel design tool built into the BD Research Cloud. Uh, www.bdresearchcloud.com takes you to a website that is free to use up to a certain amount of data that once you start storing that much and Amazon starts sending us large bills, then we ask you to pay for more data storage if you would like to subscribe. But it is free to use for things like panel design or creating an experiment or parking some data that connects directly to Flodo. So there's, there's reasons that I prefer this tool. Um, when you start it up, you end up with this screen that says, hello, John, what would you like to do today? And the one that we will focus on in today's talk is the panel design aspect of this. Uh, panel design can be started from a variety of places. Uh, I think most happily from existing work, so such as OMIPS, which are all in the BD Research Cloud, including the one that we are talking about today. Uh, but you could also start any panel design from a standard BD panel, 
you can build custom panels, either beginning from scratch or from something you built previously, and spectral design is supported. So any panel design has to start with picking a cytometer that you are designing the panel for. It's not useful, but it's not specific to the lasers and detectors that you have. Uh, in the BD Research Cloud, step one is going to be to pick the cytometer. These data were collected on the BD Fax Discover S8. So here's my screenshot of picking uh, the Fax Discover S8 as the tool that we will be building the panel for. If you happen to be you know, trying, using, demoing, working on this machine, uh, it does indicate which parameters are image parameters so that you can work with your design around the imaging parameters as well. If you also want to take pictures of your data uh, to do some validation or discover using images in the end. Okay, next step for this panel design will be to doing reagent assignment. Uh, the BD Research Cloud will display the list of reagents. If you're starting with the OMIP, then you've got it already, but you can also add, subtract, remove, whatever reagents you want to do. It'll suggest a variety of pairings based on brightness or floor chromability and so forth. At the moment you hit pair, you can then see the visualization and goodness metrics. So shown up on my screen right now are spectral signature graphs and spectral signature heat maps. And so we can look at these to see how we've distributed our signals across various detectors. Uh, we can look to see how various detectors are loaded or unloaded on the heat map view, which I particularly like. And then we will also give you a complexity score, uh, essentially the sum of all the interactions that you get here to evaluate the goodness of a particular panel. Okay, and a brand new topic that was actually introduced at CITO uh, to the general public this year by, by Peter Mage uh, is the idea that we can actually maybe even do a little better than the complexity scores for indicating whether a panel is going to be successful or not. I think the, the crux of these slides is that spread is the true enemy that we're worried about. So most of the scores that we use, you know, traditionally, uh, looking at sums of SSM or complexity, or whatever, um, you know, well, specifically the complexity and the condition number, I guess SSM does a pretty good job of reflecting spread, but they'll indicate whether there is the potential for a problem as opposed to telling if you are actually seeing increased spreading in your data which is, you know, which is what we'd like to, to actually uh, focus on trying to remove from the process itself. And I think perhaps part of what's left out of, you know, the idea that most folks have is that uh, unmixing itself can actually cause uh, artifacts in the data, depending on the total on the total panel that you're using, that it's a holistic process that sometimes you'll see effects in parameters that are not the, you know, not the specific two things that you're looking at in any given moment. And so some hallmarks of unmixing dependent spread shown here on the right are things where in the top two plots where we see two pictures, the one on the left is a 25 color panel, the one on the right is a 40 color panel. We're looking at the exact two same parameters in the plots, but the addition, the 15 colors added on in addition you can see the impact of them in spread. There is increased negative spread coming from some of the other parameters due to the total and mixing. In the middle picture there, again, 25 to 40 colors, and there is spillover spreading there in those positive populations that I've got the red circle drawn around, even though I've got the same two parameters plotted on the axes here. And then in the bottom, the tilted double negative. Like sometimes we'll see the, the double negative going up the opposite orientation and that can just look like, you know, that, oh, maybe that's just a compensation issue or something like that. The tilted backwards one kind of freaks people out most of the time and that it doesn't totally make sense. Mario Rotor at some point put a really nice paper out about uh, how we can be Panglossian to think about the total panel and understand that that is showing just real covariance in all the negative populations. And so that is just uh, illustrating, in this case, two 40 color panels uh, showing a couple of different examples where we've got negative covariance that is not necessarily just because of only these two colors on the screen. So the reason for this is that when we actually are going to try to, you know, measure the molecules and map them into, you know, instead of detector space, which can be you know, many, 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 many detectors in a spectral, spectral situation into an unmixed space, we're not only unmixing the signal, but we're also unmixing uh, also the measurement noise 
And so what the, uh, the picture on the right is indicating is the noise that comes along with the detected signal. You know, so not every detector is perfectly clean, has no noise. Some of them have some noise and that'll come with us into the unmixed space. So the, the spectral hotspot matrix is going to uh, also point out where we've got places that are actually problems, where we see spreading causing a problem. We see increased spreading, whereas the condition number or the similarity index are only indicating places where there may possibly be a problem. And so the difference in these graphics we're seeing, particularly one to the far left and the far right, is that the one on the left is showing places where there is a potential for problems. The one on the right is showing where there actually is a problem. And we know that we've got a handful of dyes that we could look at to try to optimize our panel and you know, get a successful result when we're getting up to large numbers like 50 colors. Okay. To access this tool within the BD Research Cloud, once you pair the reagents that you're interested in, there is just a choice for hotspot matrix that you can pick to display it. Okay. Moving on to scaling. Scaling is Super important, but we're gonna knock it out in about one slide here. So I want to point out in the latest version of Flojo, Flojo 1010, uh, the preference, well, in all versions of Flojo pretty much, there's this heart that are the preferences where you can set how things will be handled by default. And I think one of the most important preferences to set is your are your scaling defaults. So if you click the heart, you get to this screen right here, and there's an option for cytometers. You can click that on a per cytometer basis you can go and set your preferences. And the reason this is so important is that most algorithms in Flojo do the calculations in what we refer to as graph space. Uh, so your data will be collected at some resolution, usually 262.144 bins, you know, some, some much more granular resolution. When we actually then move the data around and start analyzing it, we will divide it up into fewer bins. Uh, the simplification here just allows for calculations, graphics, everything to be faster, easier, et cetera. And the difference in the stats on the higher bins versus the lower number bins is trivial. But it's you know, the hundredth decimal or whatever. Uh, but if you adjust the width basis or trim off the edges of the plot, the binning is slightly different. And so you can get better results if you do things like minimize how much of your data range is attributed to the negative population, where Variance across the negatives is probably just differences in noise and not something that you want to focus, say, a clustering algorithm on, finding the differences that are just based on differences in negative signal uh, or the full range of your signal. How different are two things really? Most clustering algorithms, dimensionality reduction algorithms, and so forth are very simply just trying to put things that are like together and things that are different, spread them apart. And if you trim out the white space at the top and bottom of your ranges, well then, things will look either more different if they really are very different as opposed to a whole bunch of white space occupying all your space and all your data is somewhere right in the middle of the plot and it all looks similar. So that's my spiel on why this is really worth taking a moment to do. If you click on the cytometers tab within your preferences, that'll open this window. You'll have a list of cytometers here. Importantly, we only display the cytometers that you've actually loaded data into Flojo before from and no reason to show you a whole bunch of cytometers you don't use. Make it easier to find the ones you actually do use. So if you pick the cytometer that you're using, and here I'm going with the 50 color panel, so I'm using the FACS uh, Discover S8 here as my example. Number one, uh, on that particular machine, I do recommend, and for a lot of machines actually, that you can hide some of the parameters that'll appear in all your dropdown lists within Flojo. Uh, for the facts discover, we get a dash A, dash T, dash W, and dash H version of every parameter. And you can see in my screen that I've said, you know what? I'm largely going to work with the dash A version of the parameters. You can just hide all the dash T, W, and Hs so that my drop-down menus are more concise. There's only one version of you know, CD3, CD4, et cetera, in my list because I've hidden the Ts, Ws, and Hs. But I added an and not here because I want to see scatter. I want to see forward and side scattered dash H so I can use that for diagnostic purposes. So you can set up your parameter filtering right here any way you like it to hide and make more simple your displays of parameters. Uh, this has been in Flojo for forever. It's a small spot in preference, but very important now with you know perhaps really high dimensional panels, just adding a dash H to every one of your measured parameters can add a lot to your list. Next, new is this advanced rules button. So if you click that, 
it opens up this screen here. And the gist of this is that you can go and you can click out a rule called something. So here I'm showing, again, S8 data because there's so many different parameters in this data and they have different ranges. Uh, for many cytometers, one preference for linear scale parameters and one for log scale parameters is fine. Um, that might work on just the previous screen. Uh, but if you're, you know, if you've got any of these kind of um, image derived parameters, they've got different ranges, maybe you want to set them, or maybe like me, you're just fastidious about wanting, say, different scales for forward and side scatter. Anyway, the gist is you'll hit add a rule, you'll call it something. I've called this one eccentricity, and I've added a condition that its name contains eccentricity and that it'll light up anything. It looks like also it's giving correlation the same range here, so eccentricity or correlation. It's highlighting any parameter that matches my rule, and it's showing it in the same color as the little box that's next to it. And you can see which parameters are being scaled by which one of these rules. You would then hit the transform button, and it'll show you any one of the parameters that you click on. Here, I'm switched to the fluorescent, uh, to the fluorescent image here. And I can just scale it using the typical T button operation to say, this is exactly how I'd like this to look. Say, OK. And whenever you add data from that specific cytometer, it will be scaled exactly this way so that it just comes in looking just the way you want it to right off the bat with no further effort every time after you go and set the preferences. Um, let's see. I think that's the most important part of this. I will make one small mention here that if you happen to be using uh, the S8 and Aurora or some of the Nova site cytometers that have uh, ranges that by default expand into the 10 to the 7 or greater range, you may want to come in here and set specifically your positive decades and your maximum range. Uh, typically, you know, this is these two things are related. What's your number of positive decades and the max of your range? On those sets of cytometers that can get really, really big in terms of how bright you could potentially collect signal from, uh, they are no longer always just four and a half and 10 to whatever. Um, you know, so if you move the positive decades in your T button, as you, you'll see the range go up and vice versa. So here you can go in and set the preferences with a specific maximum range and to be four and a half decades, and that'll make your fluorescent parameters look right. So I, I recommend doing that if you're on any one of those cytometers, including one of this data we're collected on. Okay. Also, there is an auto range button here. So I put the little box around it there. You can check that box for any one of the parameter rules that you've got. And what that will do is automatically attempt to set the best possible range for that parameter. It is not on by default because, the caveat, it will pick whichever sample you have first in your list uh, and use that to set this range based on. So you want to be careful that the first sample in the list is not, say, a unstained or totally negative sample so that it ends up setting a range based on just one single negative peak, which would make the rest of your data not look so good. So that is in there, but off by default. You can turn it on with the checkbox if you would like to use that. OK, that was all I wanted to talk about scaling. Moving on to quality control. <clears throat> all right, so for each of these slides, I was attempting to give you a little why are we doing this as well uh, as going through an example in some of the mechanics. Um, so this is my why for quality control, a slide that I pull up with some regularity because I just love it. Uh, it's a slide that shows an experiment that was collected by someone in a hurry. And what happened is as this person was acquiring data, and so the plots on the left here are just time on the x-axis. This is a gated overlay where you can see that the first, whatever, 12 to 15 seconds are purple. The middle one is this gray-blue. The you know, end of it is teal. This is the density plot of that. So lots and lots of events flying through at the beginning, less in the middle, almost none at the end. And you can see we've mapped the purple, light blue, and teal populations onto a couple of 2D plots. And so what this is showing on the time axis is someone who was running the cytometer as fast as they possibly could. Uh, had somewhere to go, somewhere to be. And they run into a clog right here. And then the clog breaks free. And you have what might actually be a nice range of acquisition. And then here, they noticed there was a clog. So they turned the flow all the way down. And so you've got three very distinct time ranges. And what stands out in these plots is that this purple population of kind of double positive or very brightly positive for a lot of things are all coming from those first 12 seconds or so where there is, I think, a ton of coincidence happening in there and clogging 
and just untrustworthy data that makes you really, really suspicious that all these double positive populations, you know, maybe we should look very carefully at them before we decide what to do with them. And maybe we should just take them out of the data entirely. So that is why it's good to do quality control. And we really recommend that you do this algorithmically. Uh, people can look at the time parameter and make some estimates and gate them, you know, some fairly obvious bad spots in this one, but that's a tedious process. And there are algorithms that can do it at a much finer level than I'm willing to do as a person going through all of my data samples. So the one that I want to highlight here is Peacock. Uh, I am highlighting Peacock specifically here because one, it's really good. Uh, this is an addition from Sophie Van Gassen and Jan Say's lab. Uh, that Annalise put together. It is available as a plugin into Flojo and it handles FCS 3.2 data. Um, so FCS flow cytometry standard 3.2 is the version of the standard that's being followed. Data that comes off the S8 is 3.2. Uh, so not every one of the cleanup algorithms that can be referenced out of R does accept this newer version of the FCS standard. Peacock does. And so I have used it here. Uh, the highlights of it are it's, it's nice and fast. It's pretty tunable and it actually produces some really nice visualizations so you can assess what the algorithm did graphically at the end of running it without just having to trust it. Okay, the gist of this algorithm is that whatever type of data you'd like to feed into it, there are some pre-processing steps that you wanna go through. Uh, the one that I really wanna highlight is that if it's flow data, then we may want to take out events on the boundaries. So essentially events stuck to the top bin or the bottom bin on your axis on some parameter, because it's likely if they're stuck to the top bin, well, we just can't differentiate a single cell that was very bright from a pile of cells or debris stuck together or something that would have been way off the range, but because there's a limit to what your cytometer can measure just gets dropped into the top bins. So we just generally want to remove all those. However, if you're doing spectral cytometry, maybe you don't want to remove anything that is off the scale on any one of your detectors, because if you've got a lot of detectors, you're gonna lose a lot of cells that just didn't have signal or were particularly bright on one detector and were you know, completely legitimate data uh, for you know, the large majority of them and so forth. So I recommend not using the remove margin events and I will show you the buttons in Flojo. Uh, to turn that on or off if you'd like. Um, so anyway, you unmix, you transform the data first. So uh, you'll put it on your proper scale and having either unmixed or compensated it. Uh, then you'll run the, the, you know, the bulk of this algorithm. This is different from most of the cleanup algorithms that we generally recommend people run on the uncompensated data. What you're really looking for is variability with time. So theoretically, whether it's unmixed raw, compensated, uncompensated, et cetera, it shouldn't matter. But for traditional data, why not run it on the raw data, the uncompensated data? Because then there's no way to confound a compensation error with an actual artifact from acquisition. With this algorithm of Peacock, there is a clustering step. And if we're going to try to identify similar populations, we would like to do so on unmixed, properly scaled data. And so this is the one, uh, one cleanup algorithm that we have in our, in our repertoire that we do say, you know, please unmix and transform first. After that, the data get divided up across time into a bunch of bins. We look for uh, peaks in density and signal. So per, you know, per, this is done on a per parameter basis. So you're trying to find where do you have a clump of cells that are really bright for a particular color or really dim for a particular color. We use an outlier removal here, this isolation tree, which tries to find essentially the cells that are most easily separable. So if you've got a bunch of cells that are really similar and a few that are very different, they're the most uh, easily separated. And so we're trying to figure out which of these peaks are not like the others. And then we can take them out of the data uh, through some just removing a particular bin. There's also one extra step where We'll do another pass to the data and just look for things that are more uh, than a tunable median absolute deviation away from the rest of the from the rest of the peaks value. So that just in case the isolation tree allowed some you know, particular outlier to get through, this will catch it. And then we put all of the bins back together that were good, and you've got your good data to work with. Uh, the 
data that shows some kind of anomaly removed and dropped into an, a, a gate called bad events, and then continue on with your life. So to run this in Flojo, uh, you will want to get the Peacock plugin from the Flojo exchange. So just flojo.com slash exchange. Uh, plugins are generally uh, programs that we have partnered with somebody to create a, uh, an easily you know, click and use version of a software that's available in R or Python or something like that so that you can run it again, just by clicking without having to do any programming. And so you'll download Peacock. Uh, there are instructions to install it, et cetera, all around that. But the, the gist of most plugins is you download them, put them somewhere in your computer, use the Flojo preferences to tell us where they are. Uh, if it's R-based, uh, you'll have to have R on your computer and tell us where that is. Cool. And then whatever plugins that you've downloaded, this is just a, a suite of some of the cleanup options you have. So there's Peacock, Flow AI, Flow Cut. Uh, you'll come in here to the plugins drop down menu under the algorithms band and pick a Peacock. Uh, have selected a file, and then it'll run it on that file. You can then drag and drop to the rest of the files if you'd like uh, once it completes. The process to make it run is this window pops up. It asks you which parameters that you would like to use. Typically, it's all of them. Uh, there are a couple of isolation tree tunables and what, how many median absolute, absolute deviations do you need to be away uh, to get parsed from the data. There are defaults that are typed in there in the paper listed right here. The authors go to some lengths explaining why these are the defaults that they recommend. They seem good. I don't ever change them myself. Uh, I feel like you can just run them from there. Uh, rationale seems justified. Here's that remove margins button. I say... Yeah. Don't check that if it's spectral data. You can check it if it is not. A few other options here, like you want to save the R script for you know, QC processing, et cetera. And if you're done oh, and you want the images added to your Flojo layout or just as PDFs elsewhere, hit the OK button. It runs, and you'll get outputs that look like this. So in your Flojo hierarchy, you will see Peacock bad events and Peacock good events where it has created a derived parameter and it's just isolated all of the things that were bad into one section, all the things that were good into another, made a little range gate on that derived parameter, and you can just start working on the good events. If you wanna go and look at the data, then you can go back in and we'll get a flow rate plot and then every single one of the parameters where we'll be looking for outliers that pop out, you know, as you can see some in this one particularly, and you'll see that they line up with these purple or I don't know, I guess seashell or pink colored plots that are showing either where things were removed by the isolation tree approach or by the median absolute, absolute deviation approach. They're taken out, make sure it makes sense looking at the plots, they're all put back together into this good events population and that is what you will carry forward in your work. Um, so that is Peacock, there are other options. If you are working with S8 data, then I think Peacock's the right one. If you're working with you know, essentially any cytometer, then one of the options is the right choice. Anyone's good. They're all better than either not doing cleanup whatsoever. Oh my goodness, yes. Or by trying to do it manually, which can be time consuming and you know, just not as refined as doing it with an algorithm that'll look at you know, time bins that can get down to a tenth of a second to assess uh, the quality of the data. All right, moving on to unmixing. Okay, I think we can be pretty quick on the purpose slide here. Uh, so for any given floor, it will fluoresce across a number of detectors and we want to put back together the signal, all the signal that came from one floor and attribute it to a measured target, you know, your CD3, CD4, C8, et cetera. Okay, uh, another key point here. Uh, compensation and unmixing uh, are pretty darn similar. So at least in the background here, uh, the, the primary difference here is that if you're doing traditional compensation, you have bothered to make sure that you've got a detector that lines up with each one of your fluorochromes, you know, peak of their signal. And so you know one specific detector could be called you know, the FITSI detector or the PE detector, et cetera. Those are the ones that you're hoping to see some large percentage of the signal in. Um, you're trying to make sure you very carefully select it, your detectors and your floors so that you, you've lined this up properly. Whereas in spectral, we just have a ton of detectors. So exactly which detector is the primary one, not super important. We'll end up making a parameter for each one of the floors that you add into your data. 
and we'll just have a much bigger rectangular matrix uh, collected of all the signal that we'll have to unmix as opposed to compensate. And really the difference on that is just that with a square matrix, the inversion step here where we solve this equation of, I'd like to actually suss out what the fluorescence was of my fluorochrome versus what was measured in the detectors. You, know, you can just invert that matrix because it's square. You have to do a pseudo inverse if you've got a rectangular matrix from a spectral cytometer. So the math in the background is really similar. And so there's, you know, there's, there's nothing to be afraid of with the, uh, with the unmixing math. All right, so once we've decided we are going to use spectra and we're going to unmix, there is a few other options that you can choose from. Uh, the one that I'd like to really highlight here is the use of auto spill. And so in traditional cytometry, we are going to have a negative and a positive example. And I'll, I'll show a couple of pictures on the next few slides uh, and we're gonna to try to gate them. And so that is probably the hardest part of creating a good algorithm uh, to go through and do your unmixing or your compensation. Auto spill is applicable to either case. It is trying to remove the step where we gate positive and negative populations and then try to line up median fluorescent intensities with a robust linear regression approach where we can take everything in the cleanup gate and just fit a best fit regression line through it and try to flatten that line using a traditional, the exact same looking spillover matrix that you would see uh, to modify the data. And so it's not going to require any difference in how you set up controls, how you, you know, bring them into Flojo, how you start the compensation wizard, et cetera. Uh, but it just makes it easier. It removes a step. And I'll, I'll show a few pictures here of how it works and, and some things that can help improve. OK, and I should have mentioned, sorry, that auto spill was done largely by Carlos Roca and Oliver Burton, et cetera, uh, out of Adrian Liston's lab with some collaboration from the Flojo team, particularly in producing uh, the, the auto spread, the, the auto spill equivalent of an SSM. Okay, so here's your picture of just traditional compensation where I've got a control in there, I've got a primary detector, a primary signal here on R780, I've got a secondary detector on R820, I've got a positive population and negative population that I need to identify. Flojo will automatically gate on these, and then it'll try to identify the MFI of those two populations. And its target metric is making sure the MFI on RA20 and every other detector that are not the primary detectors, uh, that those MFIs are made equal because everything that we'll put through a cytometer is going to have a little bit of background, a little autofluorescence, a little machine noise, et cetera. So we're not looking to get down to zero signal in RA20. We're looking to get to the same signal as the negative or background population. All right, so we'll calculate spillover coefficients and pop them into a matrix. That is our spillover matrix that makes this happen. Auto spill instead takes all of the data, doesn't make any gates after you've done your cleanup gate get down to get down to cells that are roughly the same size and complexity, which is a good place to start no matter what method you're using. And then it fits this best fit regression line through all of the data and makes the same kind of spillover matrix that just has to use as a target matrix, is this line flat on the primary detector versus everything else? And if flat's achieved, then we think we've done a good job. It also will go through and check. At the end of going through the first pass of compensation or unmixing, uh, because auto spill is applicable to either one, that you can you know, get a flat slope. And if you don't, then it'll take the unmixed or compensated data and run that through as the input into a second pass of the algorithm. So it's optimizing it and attempting to make the best possible compensation that it can. Okay, and when I say robust linear regression, what I mean is that we will weight events that are going through and we're calculating the regression line on to weight less events that are far, far away from all of the rest of the events. So that will help us avoid outliers uh, overly impacting our outcome. Okay, and so this is just a picture of one, I think the primary uh, utilities of autospill. And um, one primary utility I think is that it's just, it's quicker. I don't have to worry about all of those positive negative gates. I don't have to go look to make sure that they seem okay, to make sure that my algorithm gated them correctly. Um, I can just say autospill this. And with 50 colors, that begins to matter. But then you can also rescue a few parameters that my auto-gating routines will have some trouble with. 
So this is an example here where I've got signal all the way across this parameter. I've even got what's probably a positive peak, but because it doesn't really stand out, it is hard for an algorithm to identify that as a peak and gate it, whereas Autospill has no trouble fitting a regression line through all of this data. All right, so to actually put this to use in Flojo, if you're doing spectral, and we'll, we'll go with that use case since this is the how to do spectral talk, uh, check the spectral box. That is the only difference in Flojo between spectral and non in terms of setting up how the, uh, how the algorithm will work. Just check the box to turn it on. The auto spill box is right here. You'll click that. So it's traditional versus auto spill here where traditional means using gates. I mean, you could probably call that gate-based or ye old compensation as uh, again, Sabine Iverson, great name. Uh, and then spectral versus traditional over here just means spectral. We're going to use all the detectors that we that we want uh, versus one per color. Okay. And then just if you've checked the spectral box, uh, you will not match all of the detectors to all of the colors. Or sorry, you will not have a color for all of the detectors. You will, if it's spectral, you will likely have some detectors that are not used as the primary for any particular color. You will see some blank rows, and so at some point you will right click on any one of the empty box and say remove the unused. Okay. Uh, I want to point out for S8 data, the all detectors uh, box right here is very important. That is going to pick which parameters you're going to factor into the unmixing. If you're on an S8, a lot of parameters get added to the data that do not need to be unmixed because they are calculated parameters based off of the images. So they're not contributing any fluorescence into the into the overall system. Uh, if you're on an S8, click that all detectors box and deselect all of the image derived parameters or else you'll get a crazy compensation matrix where there are a whole bunch of parameters that don't really uh, make any sense in there that are treated as detectors, et cetera. Uh, so remove those. Okay, and then this is the outcome of unmixing 50 colors in Flojo. Uh, what you get up at the top is your uh, your spillover coefficient matrix up here in the bottom, you've got a plot of each of your, if you, you know, choose to pick the, uh, the, give me the n by n view of each of your combinations of parameters, the light blue color are the uncomped. You can turn that on or off with this control right here. These are heat mapped to show larger values in darker colors. So overall, this was really nice data. Good job by Martin and Andrew and Florian and team. Okay. Uh, I will briefly mention, because it's there, there's this optimize weights button within Flojo that you can click. The gist of this is that not all detectors are going to see equally differentiable signals. So if you're trying to tell the difference between, say, orange and blue, well, they look awfully similar in detector one, but very different in detector three. And so this is true for all the colors, all the detectors, et cetera. So we could weight detectors. Uh, to value their signal more or less. And we have a button, that's the, what the optimize weights button does this in Flojo. It's based on optimizing SSM. So it'll adjust the weights of the detectors to make the SSM value go down. You can try it. It can be a lengthy calculation. I, I won't give it a strong recommendation. It will absolutely bring your SSM down. Uh, will it bring it down enough to matter in such a way that it was worth the wait time? results will vary. It'll work much, much better on a really bad panel. And if you've got a pretty good panel, then it won't do it won't do a whole lot. Uh, so better, perhaps, is that you could use the BD Spectral FX tool. Uh, so it's a proprietary spectral mixing uh, tool that is available on the Facts Discover. Uh, if you collect your data on the Facts Discover, it will add keywords to the data that tell us how to do you know, effectively the same thing as that optimization tool in Flojo, but based on your actual data and your actual cytometer, et cetera. Um, and it's just, it's a, it's a much, much better approach. Uh, in Flojo, if you right click on the file, you can just hit the apply spectral effects button. It will use the keywords to create a new matrix for you. And then you've got the spectral effects um, on mixing in your data. You know, and and it's, it's quick and easy and it's one right click away. So I do recommend that one as opposed to the optimize button. Okay, the other hot topic in doing spectral and mixing is autofluorescence. And so you can extract autofluorescence if you've got some extra channels. Uh, and in fact, you can create multiple autofluorescent channels if you'd like to do so if you have enough extra channels. 
there's a couple of ways to do this. So let's start with the auto spill version. So again, auto spill isn't going to make any gates. And so it lends itself to a relatively conceptually easy way to do auto fluorescence extraction. If we just feed in unstained cells uh, into our compensation uh, or unmixing tool right here, then it will treat any deviation from a flat line as the contribution of autofluorescence. And you can create that, uh, that autofluorescence parameter um, just right here in the matrix by picking something. And again, if it's auto spill, all you have to do is pick the, uh, the total population there and it'll use it as the positive. So that's that. Um, what, makes, um, what makes this particularly nice here is that you know, this being auto spill, is that I think there's always been a debate of are, are beads better, are cells better, et cetera. Beads are really easy for an algorithm to gate positive and negative for because they're really sharp, nice peaks, et cetera. Cells, however, maybe more closely resembles your cell data uh, that you'd like to do compensation on. Uh, since autofluorescence doesn't require peak identification, that removes the benefit of making it really easy to find the peaks. And so if you want to use cells as your control, then you can also do auto fluorescence extraction where we will optimize the auto spill gates and spillover matrix based on using auto fluorescence as one of our parameters. And because all of the parameters are cells, this or all the data files are, that are contributing to our parameters are cells, this will just make a lot more sense in that when we balance the total equation, it's all using cells, it's all applicable. Uh, auto spill and auto fluorescence extraction can be used on beads because beads don't really have any auto fluorescence, at least to note compared to cells. You know, it, it won't hurt you, but I don't think it'll help you at all either. The other approach to doing auto fluorescence extraction, if you want to use gate based cytometry, is well, you'll need a negative example for gate based cytometry. And if you use a unstained set of cells as your positive, uh, that you're going to say this is the amount of of uh, signal contributed by autofluorescence, you need something as a negative. We've added this option where in the negative population, you can pick true zero from the drop down menu. And that will be the signal that we're using as the negative example for doing autofluorescence extraction. And so here's just an example where we've done a monocyte and a lymphocyte population as separate autofluorescence parameters that you can then include in your data, you can gate on. You can gate on things that are lacking autofluorescence for either or lacking autofluorescence for one specifically, or the ones that are autofluorescing for that specific kind of, you know, that specific strain of autofluorescence. If it's a parameter, you can do what you want with it. Okay. Uh, one other tool that is going to be of use for doing any kind of unmixing is the spectral plots and population viewers that are built into Flojo 1010. Uh, in this, you can click a population, click either one of these buttons in the cytometry band. Spectral plots are intended for looking at a sample uh, to understand you know, what its distribution across all your detectors are. It is a particularly nice tool for if someone says, well, okay, well, where, where is the autofluorescence? What detectors are getting the brightest autofluorescence signal? Uh, if you're going to pick a primary detector for autofluorescence, well, you can just look at a plot and see where it is. There's a bunch of tunables where you can turn on this heat map view, show the lines, don't show the lines, out of violin plot, et cetera. Uh, so that is the plots. The spectral population viewer is intended for comparing multiple populations. Um, so this is, you know, I've just dropped two different populations in. You could also drop in a specific negative. So if you've got unstained cells of the same type of cell and you want to uh, normalized to that particular unstained or just even show them on the same plot. You can add multiple populations in here. We'll graph them independently. And there's a bunch of view options for this one as well. So you can understand your data, the difference between where a particular kind of cell fluoresces and another uh, where, where another one doesn't. So maybe it's a good differentiation point or where you've got a lot of difference between autofluorescence and actual truth signal. Okay. Ooh, all right, we're doing okay time-wise, but not great. But we are into the last section, home stretch here. So let's talk a little bit about discovery. Okay, so this is again saying, I've done all the steps to get my data collected on a spectral cytometer, properly scaled, QC'd and unmixed. And now any of the algorithms, any of the tools in Flojo are fair game. There are no, um, there are no clustering algorithms or dimensionality reduction algorithms that are specific to spectral or not specific to spectral, you can use them all. So have at. 
Uh, the ones that I just want to highlight in the next, say, five minutes here to leave a little bit of question time at the end, and I do see we've got a couple of entries into the chat box, uh, I would like to point out T-Rex, so tracking responders expanding. So I think a traditional workflow, a traditional high dimensional workflow involves perhaps visualizing the data on a dimensionality reduced set of parameters. So T-SNE or UMAP or something like that, where you can holistically see all of the different phenotypes because we've, we've summarized, we've taken uh, essentially the most important aspects of all the other parameters and try to distill them into two that show all your different phenotypes, all your different populations. And so perhaps if you've got two conditions, uh, healthy and diseased or something to that effect, and you're trying to tell the difference between them, you might look at the data on a dimensionality reduction plot and say, well, where are the spots that these things differ? Uh, you might then next cluster the data and try to say, okay, so are there a particular set of uh, cells that have grouped together you know, in a unbiased manner using a clustering algorithm uh, that look like maybe they correlate to where there's a difference in the plot, and then you'll take your research forward from that spot. So T-Rex just does all of that in a very targeted and directed manner, uh, saving you the time and effort of trying to do this you know, stepwise and maybe a little bit haphazardly. So you'll annotate the data with whatever, you know, these are, these are different conditions. It doesn't even matter particularly what they are, and we'll just call them one and two or something like that. And it will make the UMAP or TSNE plot your choice. And it will look on that plot to try to identify the, the, the places where there is a difference between your two conditions. And it will use that as a locus point for then starting the clustering. So it'll use uh, a DB scan uh, clustering algorithm on the places where there was a real difference between the two cases. And you can set some thresholds here. So the lighter and darker colors of blues and reds are indicating the cases where there's a lot more cells from one condition. Uh, and it's to what degree, either 85% of the cells in this little spot of the, of the UMAP or the TSNE plot in this case are from one condition or 95% are from one condition. So the hottest of hot spots and the, the, the you know, warmest of hot spots shown in either the light blue, dark blue, or if the other condition is overexpressed, the light red, dark red, et cetera. So this is out of, uh, out of Jonathan Irish's lab at Vanderbilt. There's the reference down here. And so when I applied T-Rex to uh, the 50 color data set, uh, I started by picking out some of the subsets. Um, up to you how you would like to apply these tools, but I will suggest that if you just feed it on all of the data in a you know, collected set of PBMCs, then what you're mostly going to find is really macro level differences in large phenotypes. Uh, if you're, I mean, and that's fine. If that's what you're looking for, then awesome. You can totally use it for that. Uh, if you're actually looking for more subtle differences and within a type of cell, do I get variants in the, the particular flavor of that kind of cell? Or am I getting more you know, functional differentiation between a type of cell? Then perhaps it's nice to throw, you know, after your QC, one more gate on your data. Give me the B cells or give me the T cells or something that you can identify with a you know, really you know, strongly bimodal population in a single gate, for example. So here, I just said, let's just take a look at the B cells. Uh, this is a little bit of a toy example in that I had, I had two different, just you know, two different full stain samples from this data set to work with. So we're basically just looking for uh, bits of variability between two healthy patients. So I hit go on the T-Rex algorithm, it starts up. Uh, I pick my two populations. I just called it plus and minus, you know, one person and the other, whatever, call it one and two, doesn't really matter. Uh, I chose to make a T-SNE plot and you can set some of your T-SNE tunables here. You could do UMAP, they'll present the same kind of ideas. Uh, one, you know, one feature that I think is fairly nice is you can specify a minimum cluster size. Uh, so you can get down to, if you put in a one there, um, you know, some really, really, really small places where there's one cell, or I guess maybe, maybe only two even make sense, two from the same you know, condition and none from the other. And that's probably not super meaningful to your research. I, I, I used 50 here. I said, show me a spot where we've got a cluster that gets formed by the DB scan tool. Um, of at least 50 cells where there's real difference between the two patients. You can see that we get, you know, whatever, 33 clusters pop up. Some are fairly small. Uh, and I've overlaid them just on the overall TC map to show where they are. So there's this large population here and a couple smaller ones scattered throughout. And so that is the differences in B cells between one patient and the next. And if I said that and you're thinking, well, that 
that feels fairly unsatisfying. Just the difference in B cells. Well, well what is the difference? You know, how, like, what kind of B cells are different? Are overexpressed or underexpressed? That takes us to our our next tool. Okay, so just a picture here where I will point out that T Rex also gives you a third parameter, which is percent change. So you can get essentially a heat map of do I have more from one condition where it's the bright red, more from another where it's the blue, where you can see that kind of lined up with, um, with the previous plot where we saw the clusters, colors that go towards the greens in the middle and the yellows and so forth, more evenly expressed between the two conditions. Just for fun, we could put on the manual gates that you know, Florian did and associated with this work so we could compare you know, do we have you know particular subsets of manual gating that lines up with it? And it does look like that we've got a few of these spots that are pretty consistently the same and different. Look at the pink population here and go, okay, so there's more in one person than the other. Looks like there's a smattering of different kinds of cells up here in the top uh, based on manual gates. And we can see that we've got some associated uh, parameters that are different with them. A lot of the IgMs, IgBs are driving, uh, you know, difference in those markers are driving the difference in these populations. and we can know which clusters are which, which markers are being expressed on each of the clusters we found in T-Rex using this next tool, also out of the Irish lab that I'd like to talk about, uh, marker enrichment modeling, so MEN. And what this is going to do is take the magnitude of expression, so typically like a fluorescence intensity of your, whatever your population of interest is, your test versus some reference. And the reference is defined by you, the experimenter, something that you can, uh, that will make sense and answer your biological question. So one example of a reference could be a control population. You could uh, present some unstained or just negative for all cells of, of some kind or another. And so you're looking to see essentially relative positivity compared to some background. Alternately, if you've clustered, such as we we're doing in this example here, for any one given cluster, you could use all the other clusters as the reference. So essentially what you're saying then is, so clustering algorithm, you pulled these cells out and said they stand out, that they're different in some way. Tell me what the difference is compared to all the rest of the clusters. What is the thing that drove this particular cluster to be interesting? Okay, so that is the heart of MEM. It's gonna normalize it on a, on a you know, basically a one to 10 score that can be either negative or positive. So it can be negative if you're using this example where perhaps the reference, all the other clusters are brighter than the one cluster you're looking at. So you could have a negative MEM score in that case. If it was this case, you are unlikely to get a negative MEM score. So anyway, so one to 10, so you get a, a graded rating essentially of how much different it is. You don't just get plus minus. Um, I really like the approach of factoring in that this is biology and in and it's a world where dim exists and bright, but not as bright as that thing, you know, all that kind of stuff. So negative 10 to 10, there's this other factor here where the interquartile range uh, a ratio of the reference versus the test is factored in. So that's just to figure out if there's a really sort of messy population, just a big spread with a huge interquartile range. We just don't want to trust it as much. And so you'll notice there's a minus one term that's lumped into this. So if you get, essentially, if you get similar interquartile ranges, this term just goes away. Okay, so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a catch-all for, you know, any kind of really messy, bad population. In Flojo, if you want to apply a MEM score and append that to your cluster, names that you know what this cluster is, which parameters are driving the difference. You'll go to the algorithm band, click MEM. Uh, the first thing you have to do from these choices is create a MEM score. So you'll click that. You'll say which parameters are fair game to use. It's typically going to be all the minus maybe some, you know, some parameters used for cleanup. Like live data is probably not interesting. If you made that one top level phenotype gate, okay, they're all positive for CD3 or whatever. Cool, leave that out, but pretty much everything else. You will then select what type of MEM reference you're going to use. So auto references use all the other clusters, specific populations in there. There's also a referenceless MEM. So if you're like, I don't know, just use the full range of the data. If it's at the left end of my data range, give it a low MEM score. If it's the high end, give it a high MEM score. Cool, you could do that as well. Uh, and there's a little threshold you can pick for, tell me what level of MEM score is interesting they'd like to see, say okay. And all of my T-Rex clusters then get appended with a MEM score. And what that's going to do is on a per cluster basis say, what was the most important marker that made this population get identified as a standout cluster and give it a rating. So a lot of these clusters are just getting a plus one. So they're a little bit brighter or maybe even a minus one. There's, we'll probably find one or two of those in there somewhere. 
a little bit brighter than the average cluster. So what this is telling you for a lot of these differences that we found in T-Rex, there's a small difference between the two patients that you know, donated the blood to this. There's a handful of them, you know, cluster eight, for example, it's got a plus 10. So that one really stood out. It's got a ton of IgA on it. And that's something that we could then look at. We also might want to get more to the point here if we're like, okay, so there's a ton of plus ones, doesn't seem so exciting. You could change your MEM threshold to highlight only things that are a little more impressive. And so if all of a all of the values in a cluster get a you know a value below your whatever you typed in your threshold, and here I think I put in two. Uh, you get this MEM scores are less than marked inclusion, and then you get a highlight of what things stood out above whatever threshold you'd want to put in. I don't have a, a firm threshold on what number you should put in for your, your MEM score. That'll depend on your biological question and the sensitivity of the experiment you're trying to do. But you know, some small one or two numbers, a pretty good starting place to highlight the things uh, to see if you've got things that are you know, extremely bright and stand out the most. So there are now clusters annotated with what are the markers that drove this cluster to stand out and be unique. Okay. Okay. We are five minutes. So let me go slightly over if we, if we answer a few questions, but it'd be okay by me if it's okay with you. All right. I wanted to point out HyperFinder as perhaps the ultimate validation step. Uh, we can apply a variety of computational methods to data. And in the end, being able to sort them is perhaps the ultimate validation. However, if you've done the steps that I did here, which was to run, for example, T-Rex to identify populations of interest and say, ooh, that one with the uh, really bright IGA expression, that is the cluster that I would like to sort on. How do you get that back into a sorter? Well, if you've got HyperFinder, and this is a Flojo plugin as well in the past, and it is built in now, so either one of those are going to work about the same. The built-in works a little better if you are specifically using the S8, and that the S8 has tons of parameters, and it will look ahead of time to make sure that none of them are like no variance parameters that are difficult for HyperFinder to work with. You'll get a little message that says, hey, ignore this one. There was no variance. So that's a nice one to use if you're on the S8. Use the built-in version. Uh, you can then come into HyperFinder, pick the file that it is you'd like to work with. On the left, tell it which parameters are fair game to use to identify, to essentially find the population you found by clustering by creating a series of gates. Can I make gates that end up with the same cells that I ended up with by doing clustering? So the other part of the initiation is you point at the population you want to recapitulate. You've got a few choices for what kind of gates you're going to use. The convex polygons, the polytopes are, I think, are perhaps the most successful. Um, but you've got options. And then it'll run through, and it'll divide your data up into a target and a test population. So what it'll say is if you've got, I don't know, 1,000 cells that were in your cluster, it'll take, you know, you can set the, you can set the threshold and what, what number you want to use for testing versus mapping. And it'll take some of them and say, OK, let me see if I can draw a gate around them. And then it'll take the ones that didn't use to draw the gate and say, well, did these fall into the gate? And so you get a assessment of how good a job did HyperFinder do uh, right as the algorithm is working. You'll get this, uh, you'll get an F measure, one is perfect. So if you get something like in the 0.9 basis, that's really, really good, et cetera. Uh, and it'll end up producing high fire HyperFinder gates in your workspace that are now these you know, polygon-esque gates that can be added to Diva, or if you're using the S8, the S8's got a little Flojo button, you click it, you open your Flojo workspace, it just brings these gates exactly in, you hit sort, and then you can go collect data that you identified using a computational approach. So I think that's a really nice way to validate that this is you. Last slide, promise? Okay, I wanted to point out that all these tools that I used, you know, to take them forward, to do something with them, if you identify something really interesting that you wanna make the bedrock, of your next hypothesis or your, your, your just discovery pipeline um, is something that takes the results run on clustering or dimensional reduction, whatever you've done on one experiment and allows you to propagate them to four, propagate them to the next experiment. So that's generalized embedding. The gist of this is that you don't wanna have to, you know, every time you might run TCA, UMAP, something like that, uh, it's going to produce a somewhat unique result. You know, the orientation of the data will vary. You'll see the same population stretch out, but perhaps you'll run it one time and the B cells will go up and T cells will go down in your 2D plot and it'll be the reverse next time. So you'd like to put very consistent axes on your data if you're gonna compare 
one sample to the next to the next. You want to make sure it orients the same way. Uh, embed allows you to do that by recreating any of your clustering results, clustering membership numbers, TSNE, dimensionality reduction in general, uh, by taking the next cell or the first cell, whatever, a cell in your follow-up experiment and using the input parameters, the things you measure, CD3, CD4, CD8, et cetera, and saying, which cells are most like my new one in the original data? And we get some distance measures there and we'll weight those distances in the input space and use them to say, well, then let's take the average t sne parameters off of those nearest neighbors. And so we'll plot the T cell with the rest of the T cells. We'll plot the B cell with the rest of the B cells and all that kind of thing. So you can create the exact same t sne map or U map so that they're directly comparable. If you found the cluster in the upper right-hand corner was the one that is really good for differentiating my two conditions, you can create the same map and look to see how many cells are in that cluster, if that cluster even exists. And so that's just showing here we've moved the cell into dimensionally reduced space. We're plotting it, weighting it closest to its nearest neighbors, you know, its single nearest neighbor, maybe a little less to its second, third, et cetera. So there's just an embed button in Flojo on the algorithm band that lets you do this. It also gives you an input quality and an output quality score, which I think is really important because we will always find the nearest neighbors to a cell, but how near were those nearest neighbors? So input quality tells you in the input space how close they were. Output quality shows in the output space how close they were so that you can either use those extra parameters to filter out things that just weren't well represented and mapped poorly and gate them out or gate on them <laughs> because they are the cells that weren't there in the original data. And so maybe whatever you've done to perturb the new data set has produced this result. And so it gives you a way to selectively see which cells map the best and worst. Okay, that is it for slides. Thank you for spending this time with me. I appreciate it. It is 11.01, so I meant to leave a few minutes for questions. I'm gonna do it now. Uh, if you care to stick around, you can do so. I have something that says, do we get the slides to our mail? The answer is no. Uh, I, uh, I'm doing this webinar because it's my firm belief that you can have the slides, but 75% of what I said, uh, all numbers made up on the spot, uh, weren't captured in the slides. And it's difficult to understand those slides without someone speaking through them. So you have this webinar and you can have the recording of this webinar, which we will post to uh, flojo.com, learn, well, you know where to find that because you're here, you're listening to me. Uh, we're gonna post it there so that you get the slides and somebody talking through them. Uh, let's see, there's another question that says, hi, when using autoscale and spectral data from an instrument like the Aurora, does this require the raw, e.g. 64 parameter, or the already unmixed data from the instrument software? So if you are going to use autospill, it is because you are doing the unmixing in Flojo, so this would require the raw data. If you've got the unmixed, you're already unmixed, and you can just start working with that data. Uh, because Flojo and, well, because the FCS standard keeps uh, the data and compensation or unmixing matrices separate, you are welcome also to bring in the raw data, have the unmixed data, unmix it in Flojo, and you know, have, both, have both results present and see which one you like better. Okay, let's see. There is under more, I think, some questions in the Q&A as well. Okay, we've got, um, oh, I've got some kind of question, but then the next comment is, thanks, you answered it. <laughs> All right. And Lauren said, at what point in the process do you apply the embedding algorithm? Uh, good question, Lauren. So that is an after the fact kind of thing. It does allow you even, like you could do it on the spot. You could say, I've got a whole bunch of data files right now, and I wanna use some representative examples to make this UMAP plot. I say representative examples, because let's imagine again, the case where you've got two conditions, healthy and disease. You wanna at least take some events, or, you know, as many as you can, uh, from both of those conditions so that the algorithm, you map in my made up example here, has the language to represent a phenotype that's only present in one or the other, and then immediately embed those results into other files in that experiment. That works. But it's also fair game to say, I've run this experiment and this was the whole experiment and I finished it and I haven't even touched embed. Cool, it's done. I've identified two or three populations out of this whole UMAP plot of all the data that I think have you know, some kind of discriminatory power to identify healthy versus diseased or A versus B or whatever it is you're looking to find the difference for. And then at some point in the future, you run the follow-up experiment where you say, let's see if this is now true with more data. 
or under different conditions, et cetera. And then you can come back and use embedding after the fact. You add that data to your workspace, embed at the point in the future where you've got more data, and then directly compare and see what you've got. So it is a tool that can be used on the spot or at some point in the future. And I think of the at some point in the future is probably the most powerful application of it because it really makes conclusions drawn using a high dimensional workflow actionable going forward. It's not just a trivial, uh, on this experiment, I found this thing. It's we can test this as a real thing that happens over time uh, using the tools that make it easy to visualize, okay? I'm clicking answered live for those questions. And I think, I think we've hit our questions. And we're only five minutes over. So I think we're gonna declare victory. <laughs> oh, we've got one more here. Uh, thank you for the interesting presentation. Which algorithm do you advise to correct batch effect when such an effect for, uh, well, prevents the use of TISNI and UMAP? Yeah, that's another really good question. Um, so the example I just mentioned assumes that your data collected now and in the future have the same range. Negative falls into the same place. Your positive populations have about the same intensity if they are the same, uh, the same result. Uh, that's not always true. Sometimes there is a batch effect. And there are a variety of batch correction algorithms that are available on the Flojo Exchange that you can use. Um, which one I reckon, so first, if you can avoid using a batch correction tool by just carefully QCing the equipment and making sure everything is kept as similar as possible and that negative falls into the same intensity, et cetera, do that. <laughs> if you have to do batch correction because you realize there is a batch correction effect, you know, there's batch correction needed in your data. Um, if you've thought about it in advance and you've put in a directly comparable population. Uh, okay, so pull up the graphics here as I'm talking about these on flowjo.com slash exchange. Uh, if you've thought about it in advance and you put in a directly comparable control, you say these are healthy cells and we expect them all to be the same across all the time points, then something like Cytonorm can be used, uh, which is another Sophie Van Gassen, Isay's labs. Um, here we go, it's good in normalization uh, production. Uh, and it will use that control as a reference point to do all of the, uh, you know, to figure out what all the corrections that are needed are. If you don't have that standard that's built in across all the experimental points, then that one, that one won't work. At that point, you can either use Psi Combine or Mutual Nearest Neighbors. Uh, I think we have an entire webinar just dedicated to dis discussing normalization approaches. I think Psi Combine is probably the most popular right now. It is actually a tool that came out of single cell sequencing where you cannot really avoid batch correction um, just in, in that particular domain. So it's been adapted for flow cytometry and turned into Psi Combine. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll recommend that one. Mutual nearest neighbors one is newer. And I think it's got, I really like the approach of it. Uh, so no strong recommendation there other than Cytonorm isn't an option if you don't already have um, like a, a baked in control that you will use as the reference point across, okay? All right, that clears out the questions. So thank you again for attending. I appreciate you giving me eight extra minutes of your time even now. Uh, until we meet again. And this one will get posted to the exchange, uh, sorry, to the, um, to the Learn tab in Flojo uh, probably sometime later today, if anyone wants to share the link or download it, et cetera. Have a good one.